Uh, recording is in progress. Thank you very much for coming to the second session of our Augmented Intelligence Workshop. Uh, as you know, in this series of uh, short talks, we'll be exploring how we extend our minds uh, through both our social networks with other humans and also our technical networks uh, with various machines. This workshop uh, is organized by Rob Goldston and Marina Dubova from Indiana University, by Gautam Biswas from Vanderbilt University, and myself, I'm Mirta Galesic from the Santa Fe Institute. And so we are super excited. There is a lot of people who have registered from 15 countries. We have uh, 20, 26 speakers uh, in total until the beginning of September. And then there will be a second wave starting mid-September. So please drop us a message or post in Slack who you'd like to nominate to present. And so mentioning Slack, uh, we will be communicating in many different ways. We have a web page. Marina will be posting uh, various links in the chat. Uh, we have email that you are all uh, email distribution list that you are all on. We have a Slack channel. We have also a Google Jamboard where you can draw and post uh, notes. Um, note uh, this meeting is being recorded. And we will be, um, it will be posted on the workshop YouTube channel. So, you know, behave, <laughs> make sure your microphone is turned off at all times, except when you're speaking. Uh, feel free to post any meeting related thoughts and questions in the chat window. And uh, this chat, his, uh, chat history will not be saved. So, you know, go ahead and be rowdy. Um, and, but then use Slack channel for something that will kind of stay for posterity. Uh, Anything that you want to, um, uh, something that contributes to the to the discussion. Maybe you have your own or other relevant publications that you want to flag. Again, uh, suggestions for other speakers and so on. And we will also create this Jamboard document Marina is posting, uh, where you can collectively brainstorm. And these two will be saved. So Slack and Jamboard will be saved. Chat is uh, not saved. So uh, we will also be experimenting with different discussion formats after the talks. Last time we just had a general discussion after both of the talks, uh, but we are also considering to have other formats such as small groups and so on. And we will ask you to complete a little poll. Uh, I will, Marina will post and explain suggesting other ways of organizing the discussion. But uh, without further ado, we have two excellent speakers today. Uh, one is Mike Richardson uh, from Macquarie. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. for. Um, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, probably from Sydney. It's 1 a.m. there. So thank you very much for being here. And the other is Mark Stavers from University of California, Irvine, who is uh, having an early morning today. Each of them will talk about 25 minutes. There will be a short Q&A of five minutes. Just raise your hand uh, in, um, in Zoom uh, if you would like to ask questions. And then there will be an open discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, Mike, please. Take it away. So that, that looks so good. Everyone can hear me all right. We're all, we're all good to go. Um, well, thanks uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of the series. Um, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. So thanks to um, Mirta, Rob, and uh, Marina for, for making it all happen. Uh, at, yeah, as, uh, as you're aware, it is <laughs> quite late in the evening or early in the morning, depending on how you want to think about it. So if the talk goes terribly wrong, um, that's the reason. It's not me, it's the time zone. So just, just put that out there to begin with. Okay, so having uh, kind of put a disclaimer out there, um, I thought I'd present some kind of stuff new stuff that we've been doing in the lab, probably in the, just in the last um, uh, 12 to, to 16 months, it's kind of steered us in a new direction. And I thought this work would, would work quite well for the theme of the, the workshop. Um, so I thought I'd start by kind of showing my collaborators rather than putting them um, at the end if I run out of time. So uh, these are all the people that of course many more involved in all of the projects um, the people in the, in the red kind of uh, rectangles are the ones that are more relevant to the work that I'm presenting um, today. 
so they've all collaborated on the material in uh, today's slides. Uh, but I just want to uh, make a particular note of uh, Fabrizia. So a lot of the work I'm presenting, especially near the end of this presentation, is all kind of emerged out of her uh, PhD research in the last uh, couple of years. She's co-supervised by myself and Mario Di Bernardo, who's at um, in Naples, and uh, she did a Cochetel program. So she ended up with a, a degree in psychology and control engineering. So she's got got some great skills uh, moving forward. Okay, so I thought um, I'd kind of go through um, kind of the aim of today is to kind of understand how we can use kind of machine learning techniques to potentially predict, understand human decision making in complex multi agent tasks. Um, so we're kind of going to end up there, but I thought as I was putting this together that perhaps the best way to, to get to that point was to kind of tell the story of how we got to using the particular techniques and why as a way of kind of articulating kind of how they could be used in the future. So um, essentially this, this slide here is basically just a depiction of the kinds of things that uh, we investigate in our lab here at Macquarie, um, used to be at University of Cincinnati before we moved down here. I mean, essentially we're interested in understanding kind of how people do the everyday tasks and behaviors that we kind of, kind of do all the time and don't really think about, whether it's sitting a table, loading a dishwasher, playing a game, moving furniture, or you know, being a Kiwi and I'm obsessed with, with uh, shepherding like all New Zealanders, how we kind of do these kind of multi-agent tasks. And um, essentially what we're trying to always do is kind of model human performance in these multi-agent tasks contexts using a range of techniques in order to identify, assess, and understand how it is that we can perform these behaviors so effortlessly, how they're kind of self-organized and emergent, um, and, and the way in which the context dependence of these behaviors kind of manifests. Um, over the last, uh, I suppose, decade, um, a direct application of the modeling work that we've been done is in the development of artificial agents in uh, both training systems, as well as uh, human machine teaming, and particularly directed towards kind of taking the models that we've developed that can explain, predict, help us understand human behavior, and apply those within the development of artificial aging technologies to create kind of human-like artificial agents. So agents that are able to behave in a reciprocal manner uh, with humans. Um, so the way we do this in the lab is we do a lot of VR work. So we have people come in and we have them perform all manner of tasks. So here's just a few kind of uh, um, videos of some of the things we do, whether it's object organization, pick and place tasks. We have a virtual bar and we look at how people coordinate their movements in serving drinks. Uh, obviously air hockey is, a, is another great game that we use um, in the lab. Um, but the kind of task I'm going to focus on today is a kind of shepherding game that we've developed um, probably about six years ago um, that we uh, use quite a lot to uh, kind of probe some of our models and, and test various types of methods of developing kind of AI agents. So kind of the first part of today, I'll kind of cover what that task is, the key findings, some of the modeling endeavors. And then we'll start to kind of unpack the kind of decision processes that are involved in that task and how we can go about understanding them um, and then developing models of those decision processes. So um, the way we do this is we kind of take a kind of behavioral dynamics approach where we try to uh, you know, approach every phenomena from this idea that it's a complex dynamical system where behavior emerges and what we try to do is to find those kinds of uh, functional relations between information forces and neural cognitive constraint that bring about the emergence of some uh, behavior. So obviously agents interacting in an environment. Um, and then we want to kind of model those for the development of human machine systems and not just optimal performance or better than human performance, which is often the case but uh, you know, really try to develop systems that are suboptimal, truly human level performance, as well as suboptimal, and use all of those different levels for various types of, um, of training systems. 
Um, the way that we model uh, most of our behavior originally started by modeling kind of how people move in the performance of these tasks. And despite the complexity of, you know, kind of everybody's uh, movement behavior, um, there's been extensive research over the last, you know, 20, 30, more than 40 years demonstrate how kind of people's movements and the performance of most activities kind of fall into two types, kind of discrete movement. So when someone reaches for a target, taps a key or throws a dart and kind of rhythmic movements. And um, those two kind of prototypical uh, kind of primitives or aspects of, of human movement kind of correspond to the fundamental properties of nonlinear dynamics. So kind of point attractor limit systems and limit cycle systems. Um, and even better when you're trying to model kind of human behavior, you can essentially achieve 90% of what humans can do by controlling it for end effectors, so hands or limbs um, or body segments or entire bodies if you want, using simple mass springs or simple uh, kind of nonlinear mass springs or limit cycle systems. So I don't want this presentation to be about mathematical equations. So I'm not gonna go into the details of what these are. If you remember high school physics, then these might look relatively familiar to you. Um, but essentially what these do is, is these either projoint in terms of a point attract, attract a system from some position to some other uh, position, and then it remains there, or a limit cycle will produce a kind of uh, self-sustained oscillatory movement at a preferred amplitude and frequency. So if we think about that in terms of how we might use that to understand a kind of movement, if we imagine that our hand is this red point and we're given a goal location, then essentially what this point attractor equation will do will simply just attract your hand to that goal location. Okay? If we change the goal location then your hand will just be attracted to that goal location. So that's what this equation does. And then a limit cycle essentially, you know, with that nonlinear term in the middle there, um, it just essentially means the system will oscillate around some given uh, goal point. Yeah, so we've done you know, a fair amount of work over the last 10 years, if I said, just saying, well, how far can we push these equations to try to model and understand human behavior? So how generative are these in explaining complex behaviors? So if we now return to this kind of shepherding task that I wanna use as kind of the basis for how we start to think about modeling and eventually in the decision uh, space. Uh, so this is a task we developed um, in the lab, as I said, five or six years ago. Uh, this was the original conception it for the, for the first study. So basically people control motion sensors that control these sheep dogs. So uh, on the picture on the right there, either the orange or the blue uh, kind of square represents the sheep dog. So people are controlling those. And the task is to corral uh, the sheep, so the fuzzy round spheres, uh, on the right there into the containment region, which is the red uh, circle in the middle of the field. So these sheep are repelled from the sheepdog. So as you move your sheepdog or your player moves their hand closer to a sheep, they'll be repelled in the opposite direction. So the goal is to corral these sheep into the center of the containment region and keep them there and to do it as fast as possible. Um, and so people kind of move around, kind of trying to shepherd those sheep into the containment region. Uh, when people do this task, pretty much everybody adopts what we've kind of called search and recover, uh, which is kind of the initial pattern of behavior. So this is a, uh, um, just a playback of two people playing this game. So again, one person is controlling the blue sheepdog, another one's controlling the, uh, the red or orange one. And you can see they kind of just move from sheep to sheep, trying to corral them into the the containment region. So everybody kinds of adopts this strategy from the get-go. Some people get a little better at it. Some people can actually succeed in the task, uh, but most people find it quite difficult to um, achieve the overall goal, which is to kind of get them into the center and keep them there. And so what you find is about 60% of people at some point in the experiment, sometimes it takes them five minutes, sometimes it takes them an hour. It really varies. Um, they discovered this kind of other way of performing this task, which we call coupled oscillatory containment. So essentially they realized, well, if I just build 
a virtual wall around the, the sheep, then I don't even treat them as individual sheep. I just keep treat them as a single herd. Then I can contain them this way. And once people discover this strategy, they essentially are successful every, every single time. So um, there's a lot of details in the discovery of this process, which I'm not going to get into today. It very much ends up in a kind of nonlinear eureka moment where people kind of have this realization. Again, not everyone discovers it. But, you know, um, motivated by these kind of dynamical motor primitives, which I just introduced, um, you can model this using exactly the equations that I showed before. So for each herder, they have a radial distance and a radial angle, angle from the center of the containment area. And we can essentially model their movements as these kinds of mass spring systems or nonlinear mass springs, where essentially they move or they're attracted to the radial distance and the angle of the target sheet that they've chosen to corral at one point of time. So again, we're just changing the D of T and the A of T, the N2 um, parameters or parameter functions in these equations. And essentially it means that the, the herder just is attracted to basically the location of the sheep plus some offset. Um, as the herd gets closer together, then the kind of herd spread decreases. And there's one parameter function here at the bottom. Uh, it's again, a simple linear equation where you uh, produce a change in the side of the damping in the radial angle term. And that results in a hop bifurcation where all of a sudden you go from being attracted to a location to exhibiting this oscillatory behavior. So this, this model, just using these two simple equations, we can get kind of search and recover. You're attracted to these sheep locations, essentially. Once the herd gets within the containment area, you spontaneously shift to this oscillatory behavior. So if you implement this you know, relatively simple system into two artificial herders, then this is what those models look like. Um, so, so each herder is controlled by exactly the same model. Um, and you could see that you kind of get that search and recover behavior that looks almost identical to the search and beha behavior that we just saw in the previous slide. So this is two artificial agents. In the previous slide, it was two human behaviors. And then as they kind of get the targets in the containment region, you see the spontaneous emergence of, of COC. So really simple model, kind of using these kind of same uh, low dimensional dynamical equations um, to kind of capture how this kind of behavior um, emerges. Um, this video goes on for some time. If, if you're interested, you can check it out on YouTube, but I will let you see, you can you know, introduce perturbations and the model will spontaneously adapt to those. So it does a good job of capturing, capturing the behavior. Um, so we've tested this model in a whole range of different task scenarios with almost no changes, very minimal changes. This model can perform all the types of behaviors that you're, you're seeing here. So literally just a couple of mass spring equations within a complex context produces complex behavior, driving behavior, circling behavior, oscillatory behavior. We've run a lot of these studies where we've implemented them in an artificial agent. And in VR, we have people either in full of immersive environments um, or using kind of the more modern day version of our setup, these kind of touch screens below. We have people interact with artificial agents. Um, and in some trials, they think they're interacting with a human, but they're actually interacting with an artificial agent or vice versa. And um, both of you look at the way humans behave, they behave the same way, irrespective of it's with the artificial agent or a human. And in 70% of the time, they can't distinguish between when they're working with a human or an artificial agent. So just, just a, a, a kind of another indication that you can use these, these kind of simple models to capture the movement dynamics of a human within these kinds of complex multi-agent task contexts. Okay, so this is all well and good. This seems, seems great. And we've published a, a number of papers on this, even showing how we can use these artificial trainers to, um, artificial agents to train people. And in fact, they can train them as well as a human expert. Um, and all these other tasks, so these are some of the videos I showed earlier on, we use exactly the same equation. So basically all of these tasks and many, many others can all be modeled using those same 
two equations. Really, you just need one equation. You just need the nonlinear mass spring equation or the limit cycle equation, and you can capture all um, of these behaviors. However, there is one kind of secret caveat to how they work, and that's you need a decision function that picks the goal state. So in the herding, that is which target am I going to corral at any point in time? If you're doing a pick and place task, it's should I pick the, uh, the object up? Should I pass the object? If it's more than two people, who should I pass it to? In an example, something like uh, air hockey or table tennis or another competitive game, it's when should I hit the puck? I don't try to hit the puck constantly. I make choices about when to defend and when to attack. And so even though the movement dynamics can be captured using those simple equations, they only work, they only produce performance when they're tied to an effective decision model. So when I choose to enact certain things. So how can we model these kinds of uh, decision dynamics? Well, historically, we've used what you might want to call heuristic or dynamic computational models. So again, we collect data, we um, analyze that data, we observe, and we come up with some kind of heuristic decision rule or function that can capture uh, the kind of qualitative nature of that behavior. So for example, in the herding game, um, we basically have a, a computational um, rule, which is written below there. It looks a lot more complicated than the actual movement dynamics, which essentially a herder picks the sheep or the target that's furthest um, from and moving away from the containment region and is not being corralled by another herder or is not really close to another herder. Okay, so it's kind of intuitive. It makes sense. It does kind of reflect what people do. People kind of divide the herd up based on what side of the table they're on or where they are. And they basically corral the furthest target from the containment region closest to them, okay? So that's works quite well. The decision dynamics are really transparent because you've written an equation or a set of rules. You know exactly why things are behaving the way they are. It's very transparent. Okay, the downside of these is they can sometimes be kind of difficult to derive or formalize. Okay, so you have to put a lot, a lot of effort into coming up with these uh, decision rules. So um, there are other ways to, of course, model these decision dynamics. But for the other thing that we've been using is supervised uh, machine learning. So many of you probably know what supervised machine learning is. So you essentially have some labeled data set um, that you use uh, to uh, train a uh, machine learning model to um, detect the relationship between input and output data so that after training, it can um, uh, correctly predict uh, some unlabeled data uh, based on training. So if you have some labeled data of say different shapes, uh, you then train a model to predict those shapes and then test it on untrained data. So supervised in the fact that you're, during the training process, you're telling it where it got things wrong and what the correct answer is. And over time, that model will learn to make the right prediction. So how this works in the herding context is that we use um, artificial neural networks. We actually use LSTMs, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. And we provide kind of time series of environmental state, so position of, of herders and targets. And the label is the future target that a herder selected, okay? So not the target they're currently herding, but what target they're going to select at some time in the future. So we have this labeled data, we train our neural network, to the point where it can predict what those future targets are. So um, the pros of this approach is that the model is derived directly from, from data. We can debate the degree to which it's theoretical or atheoretical. Of course, there are some theoretical assumptions in the kinds of input features or data you use. Um, but the problem with them is that the underlying decision process all of a sudden becomes rather opaque, okay? These neural networks, huge numbers of parameters, it's kind of hard to know what the mapping is between input and output, okay? Um, although I'm putting a question mark there because as we're gonna see, that's not the case anymore these days. Um, and we're actually gonna take advantage of the fact that we can actually now look into these models to get a better understanding of what is kind of going on in these decision processes. Um, but before we get there, let's just talk a little bit more about 
how we're using SML here or supervised machine learning. So as I said, we've, we're using a, a long short-term memory network. Um, and the motivation for that is that, you know, human decisions are not things that happened in moments in time, but they're a consequence of some history of behavior that then leads to some prospective decision or action in the future. So we feed in different sequence lengths. So here I'm going to talk about data where we use basically one second's worth of the previous history of the, um, the herding environment state. So again, the herder target positions velocities are fed in as a sequence, a one second sequence into the neural network. And we're trying to predict the target in the future at some prediction horizon. Okay, so T, T horizon here. Um, and we've tested a whole range for this particular task um, even greater than 2.5 seconds, but um, predominantly between 320 and 2.5 seconds. Now, I mean, we can predict the target at the next time step, but that's kind of trivial. Um, so we haven't really, not really going to focus on that as well at the time. And um, just to show you a couple um, of, of examples of the kind of prediction success. So, you know, training these models a relatively short period of time where we're trying to predict the future target either 640 or for example, uh, 1.2 seconds in the future, which seems kind of fast, but as you've seen from the timescale of this task, it is a very fast task. Um, we can predict the target that the uh, um, player or the herder will select next at that time in the future, uh, well above 90%, most of the time above 95%. Um, what we've done is we've actually uh, applied this to both expert herders, so herders who've had like over 100 um, successful trials, they've played it for long periods of time. What we call novices, although small, they're not completely novice, we've uh, analyzed novices that did actually succeed in performing the task. Uh, so not as much gameplay, just from a single session, uh, but we've, we've trained their data on people uh, when they actually achieved uh, successful performance. And we can model both experts and novices quite well. So, you know, as alternative to the heuristic model, we can then use this model that predicts the target selection decisions of previous herders to then control the target selection dynamics of an artificial herder. So now instead of predicting, we feed in the current input state of the environment, it then selects a target or predicts a target that then becomes the target of that dynamical action model and the uh, virtual agent can uh, play the game uh, like the expert or like the novice in that case. Okay. You, if you have enough data, you can even make player specific models of a particular herder. So implication for different training systems is you can start to create kind of a a population of different herders that each have their own nuanced way of doing the task. But the other kind of cool thing that kind of came out of this work was that the models were very expertise specific. Now, this was not a consequence of overtraining. This was um, a more general phenomena that if we took uh, a novice model and we tried to have the novice model predict the targets of experts, it did a terrible job. And likewise, if we try to take a model of expert performance and have it predict the targets of the novices, again, it couldn't do a very good job. Okay. Predicting an expert, even if it was a different expert, very good. Predicting a novice, even if it was a different novice, very good, but you didn't have this kind of crossover. So it's a kind of a strong indication that these models were expertise specific. So that kind of suggests that potentially the information, the attunement, the situation awareness, whatever word you want to use, the way in which those experts and novices are making those target selection decisions are quite different. We already knew this because if you look at experts, they tend to switch less often. So they tend to corral fewer targets for longer periods of time than novices. So in order to kind of ask this question, well, what is it different about these processes? Well, that's where this notion of explainable AI comes in. So explainable Mike, AI is not new. It's been around for Mike, quite a long time. Mike, um, you, yeah. Oh, if you, um, could you could you wrap up in a few minutes? Yes, I'm almost near okay. the end. Yep. Oh, okay. yep. yep. 
So um, you've got these large number of parameters in the in neural network. It means it's hard to look at input output mappings, but basically explainable AI, AI techniques let you figure out kind of the weighting or importance of input features in relation to output states. So uh, one particular popular technique these days is um, SHAP or Shapley Additive Explanation. Um, and essentially all it does is it, is it weights input features in relation to a specific output. So you can start to uncover what features are playing more of a role in a particular output prediction. And then you can average that weighting over an entire test set to kind of get a global understanding of what a particular input feature was playing a role in, um, in a particular prediction. So we've done this for this task. Um, again, this is kind of a, a new way of, of depicting the results here. Um, I'll just highlight some of the key things. So not surprisingly, both experts and herders use the distance from themselves, the distance from the containment region and the direction of motion. Those are all kind of the most important features. And that was true for both experts and novices. There weren't huge differences between experts and novices, but there were some significant and important differences. So um, the experts tended to be slightly more attuned to the direction of target motion and to the position of their co-herder. Uh, so that's important because it really doesn't matter if the target is far away from the containment region. What matters is if it's moving away or towards. And experts were more attuned to that. They were also more aware of what targets were better afforded being corralled by their co-herder than novices. No, novices tend to focus more on velocity and acceleration, which actually has almost nothing to do with successful performance. So, you know, subtle, again, both experts and novices were being successful, but there were key differences in the um, weighting of the input features. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, you know, first of all, these SML models can predict the action decision of human actors. And interestingly here in this plot we show, this is the inter-target transition time. Um, and we can see that the majority of the transitions are well below 1280 milliseconds. So there is some indication that these predictions are happening before even the human player is consciously aware of the action decision they've made. I don't wanna claim that they haven't made the decision, that could be true, but there is the potential of making these predictions before the human has even made them themselves already shown how we can use them to control artificial agents. But the other application is then that these models can be used so artificial agents can not only predict the actions of others, but start to predict the action intentions of other human users. Explainable AI techniques can provide a powerful tool for understanding the decision making processes and what information a particular human is using to make that decision. Um, and this is, a, you know, a relatively important point in that, you know, trying to understand what someone is doing or attuned to a making decision is not an easy thing to do experimentally, but these techniques can provide a way potentially of doing that. Um, and then of course has a range of implications for both basic and scientific research and for use not just for visual tasks such as this, but for a whole range of tasks. Or just, this is the last slide um, that I'm gonna end on. And I just wanna point out that you know, at first, you know, this kind of explainable SML technique seems like it could be quite powerful, and I expect it will be. But it's important to know there's kind of three fundamental assumptions that still have to be kind of fully uncovered if the power of this approach is, is um, to be realized. So the first one is that it assumes that the input features employed in the modeling are the informational variables that human actors actually choose. So you can pick any input features you want. Um, and chances are the model will make some kind of prediction. But if you don't choose the right informational variables, then you could draw incorrect conclusions about the information that a human might be using. Uh, related to this is that this also assumes that the input mapping um, in the uh, neural network is isomorphic with the input to prediction mapping of the human user, okay? So there is that kind of assumption. This can actually be tested, um, we're testing this at the moment by running simulated actors and seeing where we know exactly what information is being used and then seeing if, if uh, SHAT can recover exactly those information um, heuristic models we're producing. Um, and then the other thing here relates to time scale again. So in order to say that a human is using a particular set of information derived from explainable AI, 
then that kind of decision needs to be made at the right time scale. Too early, and you're basing that prediction on information that may not have influenced the human. Too late, and the person's already made the decision. So again, you can't really say that the information was what was generating that decision. So these are just kind of things that you have to be aware of when you're using these techniques. We're exploring this latter one in a much more elaborate task. So we have this online video game where people play in teams of three, four, eight, where they kind of herd these robots in this large area. So here, the decision timescales are now a lot, much, much larger. And here, we're predicting not what the target will do at a fixed time interval, but what's the next target they'll predict. So that's a variable prediction horizon. And we've already demonstrated that we can predict those uh, well out to 20 seconds in the future. And we've demonstrated that those predictions are robust at a range of different timescales. So the hope is that this will let us probe that last kind of assumption about when's the right time scale in order to um, derive those mappings between inputs and outputs in terms of understanding the decision process. Yeah, so that's basically what um, I wanted to kind of present today. So hopefully that was kind of interesting and relevant to, to, to the workshop. And I'm um, sorry I went a little over time, but if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, this was fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike. Everybody can use their clap function to clap. And who, um, whoever wants to um, ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, and uh, I will selfishly start uh, while people are finding the button. <laughs> this is fabulous, Mike. I'm, it's really amazing. I was just wondering, what, uh, did you think more about the role of social learning? particular like when people play together how much a more novice person is learning from the expert person it seems to me in the real life if i was you know if you would put me to hurt some sheep i would try to see what everybody else is doing and kind of try to copy whoever seems to know what they are doing uh, did you think of that yeah yeah so so um i mean i didn't talk about all the all the studies we've done on the herding but you're right if you put two novices together you you do see social learning at some point uh, whereas if one person kind of figures it out, so in a lot of the early experience, they're not allowed to talk to each other, so they have to kind of watch what the other person's doing, and if someone kind of figures out the auditory strategy, the other person will pick it up. But more directly to your point, we have done training studies where we have put a novice with an expert, and yes, they learn much faster because they basically pick up what the expert's doing. And that's kind of one way in which we've tested our model by then having people having novices play the game with the model and demonstrated that they learn just as fast when they're playing with the model um, as when they're playing with a human expert. In fact, they actually learn a little bit faster. Um, I've also got another colleague who's um, done a lot of work in kind of social cue utilization um, and has also demonstrated that people who are kind of more sensitive to, uh, you know, picking up social cues tend to learn the task um, slightly faster. So absolutely that, that's the case. Um, and in and a lot of this work, it's this kind of implicit learning that kind of goes on um, in these kinds of, of task contexts. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question from Amit, and then we'll proceed and then hold your questions later for the general discussion. Thanks. Uh, sorry for being the last person. Um, this was really interesting. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about this phase change in, in learning, which seems to be really important and kind of uh, you know, we see this a lot in sort of developmental psychology and if there's anything that you can say about what, what can you, when can you predict that would happen, what, when does that sort of the realization that there is sort of a superior strategy and, and what, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great question and one that we have tried extensively <laughs> to come up with, with if there's this one thing and I can tell you there isn't just one thing. Um, it's really variable when it happens. Um, the, there is a couple of things that um, is a really good indication of whether someone will discover it. The primary one is if they're really bad at, at search and recover. If they're not very good at that, then they're much more likely to discover COC than someone who's kind of moderately good at, at um, SNR behavior. There does seem to be some indication that the oscillatory part emerges through the tracking. So as, as the sheep kind of come together, what happens is you'll go over here and then you'll move over here and then you'll go back over here 
and then you'll go back over here. And if you do that, you know, just three or four times, that seems to be a pretty good indication that in the next moment or the next trial, you'll have that realization that it's that kind of circular movement. And then you see this intentional switch where it go, goes from being just kind of emergent oscillation to kind of an intentional oscillation. So those are kind of the two things that, that we've discovered so far that seem to predict when it will discover. But as I said, not everybody does, only about 60%. Um, but yeah, it, and again, some people it like within two trials, some people they can play for an hour, even an hour and a half and not figure it out. So, you know, it's, uh, it, I mean, the other predictor is whether you play a lot of video games. If you play a lot of video games, you, you tend to figure it out pretty quickly. So that's kind of a non-answer to your to your question, but it's something we're we're looking at and we're doing some eye tracking studies at the moment to see if it's something about kind of visual attention that that maps onto that discovery. Thank you. That was great. Uh, I know that uh, at, uh, in Australia it's close to two a.m. Please post your uh, questions, further questions, also in Slack or on Jamboard, and we'll nudge Mike to answer them later if he falls asleep. And now I yield to Mark. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, all right. Um, okay, so you see my screen, right? All right, well, thanks Marina and Rob for organizing this and thanks Mike for giving you a wonderful presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about human AI collaboration and this is collaborative work with my machine learning colleague, Pork Smith and some graduate students in cognitive science and uh, computer science. So AI is everywhere these days. Uh, AI is collaborating with or coordinating with humans in a number of applications. For example, AI can give medical advice, legal advice, dating advice, and in transportation applications, AI is helping us uh, drive our cars or is delivering uh, food to us on various uh, campuses. At UC Irvine, these uh, food delivery trucks, they're uh, kind of kind of cute at first, but they're kind of annoying now. We have to sort of coordinate with them, swerve around them. Uh, there's too many of them at, at UC Irvine at the moment. Um, in many of these applications, the goal is not to replace humans, but rather to augment uh, human performance. And we have taken an interdisciplinary approach by combining some insights from cognitive science and psychology, understanding sort of what is going on in people's minds when they collaborate with AI. And we combine that with AI and machine learning uh, research. But clearly, this is a very broad topic. This is very complicated. And I would love to hear uh, your insights from other disciplines, other approaches in human computer interaction, education, engineering, neuroscience. Uh, we clearly, uh, we've just barely scratched the surface of, of this topic. So today I'll focus on this question of the effectiveness of human AI collaborations. How accurate uh, are systems that are based on hybrid human AI uh, combinations as opposed to just uh, humans by themselves or AI uh, by themselves. The particular setting here, and this is important, uh, we focus on situations where the human and the AI, they can perform the same task. They can perform the task by themselves um, and then we see what is the performance we can get uh, by combining the human and AI uh, decisions. The application domain we'll focus on, we've worked on a number of different domains, but here I'll report results from image classification. So this is a very simple domain. It's not the most compelling sort of application domain, um, but on the other hand, we can do a lot of good foundational research, which is really the goal. So we have images uh, taken from the ImageNet uh, domain, and uh, there's lots of AI algorithms designed to classify what's in these images. You know, is it a dog, is it a bear, a bike, etc. And people are very good at this task, uh, as well as current AI algorithms. But to make this hard for both humans and AI, we add some phase noise, uh, as you can see on the screen. This can make it arbitrarily difficult uh, for, for individuals to classify the objects. Uh, in terms of the um, AI uh, or machine learning algorithms, we use convolutional neural nets. The goal for us is not to advance uh, state-of-the-art. 
we just take existing off the shelf um, classification algorithms that represent uh, different states of the art uh, in, in history of deep neural nets. So AlexNet was the first deep neural net that was really quite exciting. And then there were various improvements, Google Net, ResNet, DenseNet, BGG19, that each sort of improved uh, on the previous state of the art. And we look at all of these AI algorithms, how well each of these performs when you combine it uh, with a human. I should note that this, uh, this noise that I mentioned, the phase noise, this is not something that these deep nets are familiar with. So we also uh, uh, train these networks to various degrees. This is, called, this is a process called fine tuning. We train these networks to various degrees to this phase noise, and it uh, leads to even more variations of neural nets that we can look at. So there's two parts of this research. Um, so first we'll look at statistical combinations where we have a single machine classifier and a single human and combine it into one sort of classification decision. And there's no real collaboration of any kind uh, in, this, in this setup. And then we look at very simple collaborations where the AI is providing recommendations on the classification and the human can decide to use this recommendation or choose to ignore it and then the human is in charge of the final decision. And this uh, aligns with a lot of these practical applications like doctors relying on medical advice, uh, you know, legal practitioners relying on, on an AI algorithms. All right, so in all our, our experiments, uh, we use Amazon Mechanical Turk participants, uh, no experts. Um, so we present images of various levels of noise and in this case, the decision is to classify these into 16 basic level categories by clicking on one of the icons on the screen. So this might be a difficult decision. Some of you might see that's actually an airplane, but you might not be very confident. So you also submit your confidence level uh, for each classification. Uh, this image is a little bit easier and you can clearly see it's a bike. And so you might be uh, high confident in this particular trial. Now, what's interesting, if you run these images through, um, through these machine classifiers, uh, these machine classifiers, these deep neural nets, they were designed um, or they had sort of the human brain in mind uh, from an architectural point of view. And some people argue that these deep neural nets, they operate like humans, but there are very interesting differences as well. Here are images that are easy for human participants. Our participants are very confident about what's in these images. But for whatever reason, the machine classifiers, they don't know what's in there. They're very low confident and they all make mistakes systematically. So you can see this is a car, a car, a cat, a cat, a bear, and a bear. On the flip side, we also have images that are human participants because they're so noisy, they're very confused about these images. Like what the heck is in there? But the machine classifiers, they are very confident about what's in here. And some of you might see it. I, I still don't see what's in these images, but here we have a bird, a boat, a bear, a bear, an oven, and an oven. So I, I'm cherry picking some examples here, but this shows that some of these deep learning algorithms, they operate in different ways from humans. Yes, they are correlated to some degree, but they also, uh, they know different things. They can pick up on different visual features and that's good for our purposes. Uh, we want um, the AI to have different skills, to have different types of knowledge, because this is what's going to lead to complementarity. So in this project, we look at pairs of, of agents. We combine either two machine classifiers, we combine two humans, and we combine a machine classifier and a human. And the question is what happens when we look at these hybrid pairs? Does the performance of a hybrid pair sort of exceed the performance of a machine-machine pair or a human-human pair? That would point to complementarity. So uh, more formally, so we look at this um, issue of complementarity. Is there something unique going on with uh, putting a human and a machine decision together? And we uh, define the complementarity here as a human-machine pair exceeding the performance of human-human and machine-machine. 
How we combine these decisions is a, a bit complicated. We use a Bayesian combination model, and I just won't go into the details of how this works. Um, it's, it's a non-trivial problem because classifiers, they produce confidence scores in a different way from humans. So these classifiers, they have uh, a vector of, of confidence scores across all 16 categories, whereas in our experiment, a human just produces a confidence in just their final decision, their one classification. So we develop an, an approach where we can combine these different types of um, decisions and, and confidence scores in one framework. Now, the key uh, in this framework is that we can also estimate the correlation. What is the latent correlation between the human and the uh, machine uh, decision? So here are some results for the uh, images that are not very noisy. So a single human is pretty good, 90% accurate. When we combine two humans using this Bayesian combination model, so now we have two humans combined into a single decision, that improves the uh, accuracy to about 92% accuracy. This is simply like a wisdom of the crowds effect. You select basically the human who's more confident, who tends to be a bit more accurate. If we look at individual machine classifiers, uh, these are the ones that are not very fine-tuned to this noise. Performance is a bit worse than a single human, about 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.85 uh, accuracy. But interestingly, despite this lower performance relative to a single human, when you combine these classifiers with a single human, you get the results shown in green. The hybrid performance is better than what you would get by two humans. And it's better than what you would get by combining two algorithms. So there's something really interesting going on when we combine across different types of, 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 of classifiers, if you will. So this is an example of complementarity. And I should note, this is very important, this doesn't always happen. So the literature shows a variety of results. Sometimes complementarity is achieved, sometimes it's not achieved. And we get these sort of uh, mixed results, this sort of confused picture. And our goal was to understand when does this happen, this, this, uh, this fine of complementarity. And the, the key, one of the key here is the correlational structure. Um, humans tend to make similar judgments. And the model that we use estimates that humans uh, sort of confidence generating process uh, correlates to about uh, 0.7. So we don't always agree on our, our classifications, but uh, across trials, there's a fair amount of agreement between humans because we share the same visual system. These classifiers, even though they're organized very differently, they're different architectures, uh, they're trained on the same images, so they're also correlated with each other. But if you look at human machine pairs, their correlation is not zero, but it's far lower. And, and this, this shows that uh, humans and machines, they're, uh, they're just organized differently, diff use different processes, use, have, probably have been exposed to sort of different uh, training materials, um, they just know different things. So now the question is, um, when do these human machine classifiers produce complementarity? When can we expect this finally? So this graph shows um, uh, a huge number of different combinations of human and machine classifier pairs. So each circle is a particular combination of one human uh, with a machine classifier. And all these different circles are different types of machine classifiers, different levels of training on the noise, uh, different levels of image noise. And you can see lots of variation on the vertical axis, which is the machine classifier accuracy by itself. On the horizontal axis, you can see variations in the human classifier performance by itself. We color the, the circle red if we observe complementarity, right? If that combination of human machine leads to better performance than human-human or machine-machine. And you can see that we can expect complementarity if the difference in accuracy between a human and machine is not too large, right? They don't have to be at the same level of accuracy, but there shouldn't be too much of a difference between them to get complementary results. If they're outside of the zone of complementarity, then it's better to just go with two humans or two machine algorithms, you know, whichever pair is better. 
Now the uh, that colored region that I'm showing you here, this this pinkish reddish region, that is derived by mathematical analysis of the uh, combination model. So for the particular level of correlations between uh, humans and humans and machines, this is the zone of complementarity. This is where you can get uh, that complementarity result. We can also use the mathematical analysis to uh, analyze the counterfactual. So what if the human and machine were completely uncorrelated? And then you get a much wider zone of complementarity. In this case, and we never observed this, by the way, so there's always some degree of correlation between classifiers of human and machine. But in this hypothetical case, we could combine a human at 80% accuracy with a machine classifier at 35% accuracy and still do better than, let's say, taking two humans at 80%. And this seems kind of counterintuitive, but the key idea is that these machine classifiers, even though they perform very low, they can complement uh, the human on, 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 on some trials. So the implication of this research is that AI models do not have to exceed human performance to be useful. AI models can be uh, far less uh, accurate and still uh, help the human uh, across trials. Also, um, the goal here, uh, if, if the goal here is to optimize human machine teaming, then we want AI models to be as uncorrelated as possible from human judgment. And I'm a cognitive modeler. I tend to build models that are similar to humans. But in this case, uh, we are sort of flipping a switch here. And now we uh, want models that are dissimilar from humans as much as possible, because this will help uh, the complementarity, uh, this will optimize for a complementarity. And there's now very various machine learning algorithms that have a specific training objective, uh, not, to be, not to be as accurate as possible, but to know different things from humans. And I think that's a very exciting direction. So now I'll go briefly into this uh, other um, approach where there is uh, a bit more of a collaboration, although a very simplistic one, where a machine learning algorithm is providing recommendations to the human and the human makes the final uh, decision. And there are many different paradigms where the, the human or the, the human can receive AI assistance. Uh, the paradigm that we'll look at is where the AI is always available. You don't have to ask for it, it's present. Um, the other paradigm, the second bullet, is often used in the judgment and decision-making literature. Uh, here, the human first makes an initial independent judgment, then you show the AI advice, and then the human is, is allowed to revise. Um, and then the third approach is where the AI assistance is potentially available, but needs to be solicited by a human. And this, uh, this leads to various interesting additional complications. So we use um, the same paradigm as before, image classification. And in our user interface, uh, in some trials, the AI advice is shown on this uh, panel on the right. The AI classifier shows the confidence on these various categories. So in this case, the classifier is pretty confident it's a bear uh, based on this green highlighting. And it's um, somewhat less sure that it could be a dog. And then the human participant in this case can look at this and can um, either adopt the advice or can ignore it. But there's a subtlety here. The human can also know that it's a bear independently of the AI. And so that, that presents an interesting uh, problem when analyzing this data. How do you know when a person is relying on the AI advice or when they were independently coming uh, to the correct answer? On some other trials, uh, we uh, turn the AI off. In this case, we can see you know, what is the accuracy uh, of the human participants uh, by themselves. So here are the results of the AI algorithms by themselves. These are simple machine classifiers. And we look at three different types, uh, A, B, and C. And A, B, and C are the same classifier, VGG19. It's a deep neural net. But we pre-train it on this noise to different levels. So the classifier on the right, classifier C, is just more aware of this noise. And it's just better at the high levels of noise. And then we uh, use human participants in these three different conditions. 
So the orange line shows the human performance when they are not assisted by the algorithm. And we see that the human performance is better, um, uh, better relative to the classifier A, and it's somewhat worse than classifier B and C. And now the critical condition is what happens when the uh, AI assistance is turned on. So this is the advice on condition. And in the uh, left panel, the classifier A, we see this complementarity. So even though on average the AI is worse than humans, the AI is still helpful. It can boost human performance above and beyond uh, the human by itself. And for the other two cases, classifier B and C, uh, performance is about the same as human performance by itself. So we wanted to know, okay, so how do individuals rely on AI assistance? And for this, we, um, we needed a cognitive model because it's not quite clear uh, how you can measure reliance. Uh, in some paradigms, you can immediately empirically assess, you know, when is a human relying on AI assistance? But here, it's not quite clear when a person is independently coming to the right decision versus uh, looking at what the AI is doing and then uh, copying that advice and coming into a decision. Now, to solve this problem, and again, I won't go into any details, we use a Bayesian model where reliance is a latent variable. Basically, we look at the difference between what's happening in the AI on condition and the AI off condition to estimate the reliance. And reliance is a latent variable in this model. So here are the results of the estimated probability, that's the vertical axis, that a person will take the advice of the AI when initially they disagree with the uh, AI. The results show that people are more likely to adopt the AI recommendation when the classifier is highly confident. That's the variation on the horizontal axis. And uh, when the human um, uh, participant is in a uh, low confidence state, that's the variation between the different uh, colored lines. So this shows that um, people don't, don't just adopt one single strategy, like always relying on AI advice or never relying on AI advice. People use a more flexible strategy that can sort of vary from trial to trial. Uh, to verify whether this model um, makes any sense, the, these are latent variables that we're estimating. Uh, we also run this paradigm in a different, different way. In this paradigm, uh, the results are shown on the right. The human first makes an independent decision. Then the AI uh, recommendation is shown and then the person can revise their estimate. And this is a sort of popular paradigm in the judgment decision li literature. And the results uh, are very similar, uh, at least at the qualitative level. Um, and to us, this, this is very exciting because it tells us that we can apply cognitive models to estimate you know, what is going on in people's minds when they are thinking of an AI advice, uh, when it's just always there, when it's always uh, sort of available. So the implication of uh, these results is that human advice taking behavior is quite flexible and it depends on a, a mental model that people develop of this uh, algorithm. And it, it incorporates several factors. Uh, one is how confident is the human in its own decision for that particular trial? Or uh, what is the AI confidence for that particular trial? So what is the trade-off between their own confidence and the AI confidence? It also depends on what is the perceived accuracy of the AI. This policy, this, this reliance policy, it shifts up and down depending on how accurate the AI is. And even more complicated is um, when you, when participants can opt in uh, to, to the AI advice, that's a different experiment, different setup. Uh, time is also important. Uh, how much mental effort or time is required to process the AI advice? It's not just about, can the AI make me more accurate? It's also, how much time would it take for me to process all this advice? And we find that in these low stakes uh, settings that we're studying, like image, uh, image classification, 
with uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, participants, they often don't bother to solicit the AI. It's just the, the improvement in accuracy is, is not worth their time. Uh, clearly, this would be very different in high stakes situations, doctors you know, relying on medical advice. All right, so last slide. Um, the, the interest, the goal of this research is to maximize this uh, human AI collaborative potential. So uh, we have shown along with um, you know, other, many other researchers that this requires AI agents with complementary capabilities, right? The whole promise of AI is that it can do things uh, better or in different ways, right? And we can train AI agents specifically to complement humans. Uh, another dimension that's very important is that um, in human machine teaming, you need to have accurate self-assessment. Humans are reasonably good at being aware of their own knowledge limitations. There are some biases, but I think it's fair to say that AI is not very good yet at knowing what it doesn't know. This is one of these research frontiers. We need to have AI systems that are better, that have better metacognition. We also need to have uh, accurate mental models. The, AI needs to be capable of building an accurate mental model, if you will, of what the human can do. And the human needs to have an accurate model of what the AI can do. There are lots of biases that can potentially occur in building these mental models. In our very simple domain of image classification, we find that humans learn very quickly of what the AI is capable of. But of course, in other domains, people might make all kinds of mistakes about what the AI can or cannot do. There might be all kinds of prior biases. And again, we don't, in terms of the AI mental models, we don't have good AI um, uh, machine learning approaches yet, AI models that can uh, really understand human capabilities. So Mike talked about AI needs to uh, differentiate between uh, novices and experts, perhaps individualize the models of the humans. And I think a, a lot of exciting research can be done there. And finally, um, we need to communicate right, with the AI in some way. Uh, we looked at very simple communication um, methods, uh, basically exchanges of confidence. The AI shows how confident it is to the human. In other research, we show you know, the human tells how confident it is to the AI. Um, but in the end, what we also will have to look at is natural language. And this opens the door to an even more complex uh, sort of uh, uh, domain of you know how how can you effective effectively communicate with an AI through natural language, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was fabulous. Uh, we all learned a lot. It's excellent research. I will uh, before we take questions while you are all thinking of your questions, Mar I will uh, yield to Marina, who thought a lot how to improve our discussions. And uh, Marina, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, just a couple seconds for uh, for this. So we are thinking about how to make the general discussion after the talks more efficient to harness all your minds together. Uh, so and we thought about different ways. So the current way we're doing this is more centralized. So everyone is in the room asking questions, potentially um, talking to each other. But the other ways we could do this is more de decentralized. So for example, we could have uh, small rooms where people could meet meet each other and talk about the talks and the topics in the groups of six or seven people where we would, uh, yeah, where some of the speakers would randomly be assigned uh, sometimes, but that's a downside is that the speakers won't be there all the time. Uh, and the other version is having two, uh, two groups where each one of them will have one speaker, but in this way, the speakers want to interact as much. So we were interested in what you would prefer for us to try. So uh, we created the poll, which you could answer uh, with your preference for the group uh, for the group discussions. But even if we do um, something more decentralized, we'll still have the centralized ways to combine your thoughts, such as in the um, in the Jamboard or in the Slack. So it's always going to be there. Thanks. Thank you very much. This poll is really cool. Look, it goes in real time. This is excellent. So uh, please uh, raise your hand if you want to start a discussion. I know there are many questions in Jamboard in chat. Otherwise, I'll start asking my questions. And 
Okay, Yink, go ahead. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, I really enjoy both presentations. And the first question is for Mike. Um, it's a very intuitive question, and uh, I, I don't know whether you already studied. Um, so I, uh, following up for um, following up with uh, Marita's questions about learning, um, I think the most important, especially as educator, it's we teach students knowledge, and then they will apply the knowledge uh, when they make the decision. So I'm just curious in your research, how would you incorporate those uh, strategies? For instance, not train the participants, just tell the participants these are the better strategies, just apply it. Um, so I'm not sure how you can incorporate that in your research. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one, but it, I'm just, is there anyone that has a, a question from Mark first while he talks on the top of everyone's head? Or, but I, I'm happy to answer that question, but um, I just want to make sure that there isn't someone who wants to jump in for, for Mark right off the bat. Um, I do have a question for Mark. You wanted me to yeah. ask this? <laughs> well, I, I could give you a quick okay, answer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have, um, we, we have even run that experiment. And if you tell people what, you even show them a video of what the solutions are, they don't do them immediately. They still need to, they still need to experience the task. Obviously they learn it much, much faster, um, but they still need to kind of play the game. Like, like any task, like I can tell you how to swing a baseball bat, but if you've never swung one before, it's gonna take you a while to figure out how to do it. And it's the same thing in this task, that the time scale of the learning is much, much shorter but there still is the same exploration, the same emergence. It just happens on a much faster time scale. Um, but yeah, we have actually have, have done that. And, and that's basically the, the result of that, of that experiment. So would you put those strategies in your objection function and like adding something in your model? Or are you still going to use those two equations you use to solve this problem? Yeah, we don't have to change the model at all. Um, what happens is that the, uh, you get you get a more sophisticated uh, decision dynamic. So if you were to model the decision process, you would see that they would more quickly converge on the target selection process that you see in experts rather than than novices. But the actual movement dynamic model, you don't have to change a thing. Wow, that's amazing! Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, can I ask a question for Mark now? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, Mark. I really enjoy it. And I feel there's so much potential about the AI and the human interactions. I mean, think about system one and system two. I think uh, AI can be very good at uh, de-bias human decisions. But in terms of your research, I'm really curious, is there any pattern about whether human recognize image better or the AI uh, recognize image better. What I have in my mind is, is there any stereotype or standardized display of certain image? Like for instance, we're more, uh, we can recognize some picture better because we being exposed to that picture more often than another way of presenting the same object. So I'm just curious whether there's anything uh, the, the research contribution would be if you present picture in a certain way can be better recognized by human, but if you present the picture in another way, better recognized by AI. Any insight? Yeah. yeah, thank you for this question. There are subtle differences in performance. Uh, so I think uh, humans are not as confused by cars and trucks, but the classifiers are. They think these are very <laughs> exchangeable categories. And so you could learn a model or you could augment the, uh, this Bayesian combination model with sort of extra knowledge, like what, what confusions are more typical for these classifiers and less typical for humans and vice versa. And that improves performance, learning about particular mistakes that humans and, and machines make. But what's interesting is that it's um, that performance by tailoring, you know, learning about, uh, you know, uh, performance specific uh, differences, uh, it's much better to just get confidence uh, levels from people. Um, if somebody says, hey, I, ca I can take this one, 
or the machine classifier says, hey, I, I can take this one, that is as powerful, if not more powerful, than learning this complex model of you know, who is good at what. So, uh, so there's important trial by trial variations uh, that we typically ignore, right? So for particular problems, one person or one algorithm might be best suited for that problem. And how would you know? Perhaps through some confidence assessment. Oh, um, okay. Um, a, a quick comment about, I think your research didn't mention this. I, the assumption is people have, people have knowledge about what they don't know. So you said that people better knowing what their limitation. Um, that reminds me of the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> so there's actually people think they know everything that they know nothing. And then your confidence low, uh, level drops to a certain point when you're at the middle. And then your confidence level increase when you are a true expert. So I think that'd be something interesting to test um, to show when people actually don't know their limitation, their, uh, whether their um, collaboration with AI would be completely different from the expert collaboration with AI. Right. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is something we were very interested in. Uh, I do believe it's real, but very few studies have actually demonstrated the Dunning-Kruger effect. Very, very few. Most studies that claim to show Dunning-Kruger effect is just a regression to the mean effect. However, I do think there's something to it. And in some experiments, we know that humans who are expert at something, they do look at the information differently than novices. Uh, but we also find that, you know, very simple heuristics of how people assess other people are very effective, regardless of how, what their own performance is. So yes, there's the Dunning-Kruger wrinkle, uh, but th that, that is, I would say, a very small wrinkle. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. Uh, Gabriela, what was your question? Thank you. Uh, that presentation was very enlightening. I I had a follow up on kind of what you just said when you were answering the previous question. So if, if it would be possible, and the framework for this is I can picture this as like an assistive technology. So if the framework is an assistive technology and there's a certain level of a confidence threshold where if the participant falls below that level, the AI takes over a little more often versus when the, the participant feels really confident and they are able to make the selection appropriately more often, is it possible for the AI to respond to that as that sort of decision-making threshold for when it decides to take over? So I'm thinking about a person with limited vision using that assistive technology to make decisions about the navigation of the world that they're in versus a person who has 20-20 vision who might not need something like that. Yeah, I think so. Um... In, in all the models that we looked at, um, it is the case that if one, if the AI is more confident, it should basically take over. It should, it, it is, it will be more accurate than what the human would do. Um, so is that assistive, well, in some ways you're breaking sort of the, the idea of assistance because it's, you know, the AI is now in charge, right? Um, and there, there, there are all these different setups. Uh, who can take the initiative? Is it mixed initiative? Can the AI also be responsible? If that is the case, then yes, the AI can assess, you know, when, when should you just make the decision and just go ahead? And in low stake situations, that's totally fine. You know, making a mistake on images, who cares? In medical situations, legal situations, do you really want the AI to take over? I'm not so sure, right? These are, these are complex, debates uh, that, that we have to have. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. It was, I was just curious if there's, a, if there's a set way to create a confidence threshold between the AI and the human user so that when one falls below that, that threshold, the other takes over. Yeah, I mean, from a modeling perspective, this all comes down to calibration. So, so the human confidence, sort of, what is the relation to accuracy? The machine confidence, how does that relate to accuracy? 
and where both are calibrated, then you can just compare the confidence level as one is higher than the other, that agent should be responsible. Uh, and then it comes down to uh, how much information do you need to calibrate? And that might take you know, some, uh, some learning, I guess, to, to understand sort of what are those relative, what is that threshold at which you can pass it to one person versus the other? Thank you. Sina, you were waiting for a question for a long time. Uh, hi, uh, Mar this question for Mark. Uh, I really like the presentation and I completely agree that in cases where the AI is being used as decision support, we should think about it as in terms of complementarity. But uh, I think one of the things that has kind of occupies my mind when I look at uh, studies of how these systems are actually used by judges and others is the interaction between uh, cost and uh, kind of human reliance. So I'm thinking that suppose we uh, optimize a system for complementarity and kind of, as you said, typically what happens is that the system that is optimized for complementarity exhibits less accuracy as a system that is optimized to, let's say, minimize error in some sense, right? So the system that is designed to be a good decision support overall with the human, if, he, if the human knows when to rely on it and when to rely on themselves, will outperform the systems that is best from a predictive performance perspective. Now, the challenge is that if the situation is costly and the humans rely on the uh, predictive model a lot because they wanna evade responsibility, from a kind of larger institutional perspective, should we really optimize for complementarity if in practice people will really rely a lot on the model and they they are not aware uh, when their input is needed uh, so i don't know if the kind of question is clear but the idea is that when we bring the cost to structure of the environment we complete which can change the human reliance behavior how many of these benefits of complementarity do you think will be realized in practice yeah, I think we, we've taken a pretty narrow perspective on complementarity. We just optimize for, let's say, short-term outcomes, right? What's the accuracy now on this trial? But the long-term success of human-machine teaming, it, it, that depends on a lot of factors, right? So do you really want a human to constantly rely on the machine? Is that is that a good thing? What exactly... Do we want to optimize for? And I don't think it's just accuracy, right? There's um, there's autonomy, right? People are happy when they're autonomous or feel like they're in control. And how do we pit that against accuracy? Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to this, but uh, clearly, uh, just optimizing for accuracy it's not it's not going to work. It's not going to be sufficient. And so our experiments are just short term. They're like forty minute experiments. Uh, but real applications, we're talking about, you know, humans relying on this technology for months or years, right? And would be re really good to do this long-term research. What happens at that long time scale? Thank you. I'll, um, I have this question I'm eager to ask. Um, what about machines uh, using humans as advice? Uh, so, uh, how uh, is the are humans particularly good in understanding when to use machine advice? And you have a good model of that. How about if you apply this model to machines and see when they are going to take the human advice? Would the performance of machine human pair, if you wish, machine relying on human advice, be similar to the human machine pair? Or is there something that the model that you have now is maybe not covering? Are, are humans somehow even better than machines? in understanding when to learn from the other individual. Yeah, I do think that humans, uh, in terms of developing mental models of other agents, that they're superior. Um, uh, it's easy for any AI model to just keep a tally of you know, a history of results. So in that sense, machines will always outperform in terms of mathematical calculations. But, uh, we have not been able to, to build sort of machine learning slash sort of cognitive models for the AI to learn about humans. Uh, humans, and this is the part of the talk that I skipped. Uh, I talked about it in the abstract, I didn't talk about it here. Uh, humans are better sort of mind readers or uh, uh, they are better assessors of 
another person or an AI, then an AI is of, of I think that gap can be narrowed, it can be addressed. Um, and I think that's an exciting area for interdisciplinary research, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Ami. Yep, just a sec. Hello. Hi everybody. Thank you very much both Mike and Mark. This was terrific, extraordinary and well worth waking up. Um, I think I just want to follow up on the complementarity, Mark. So um, you've pointed out that it seems to derive at least partially from the lack of correlation or that there's an advantage in reduced correlation. And I wonder if you, if you hand those tasks over to a human and, and a bot, isn't there a, a constraint, a built-in constraint on how uncorrelated they can be because the input is always correlated. They always feed in the same input. So in a sense, my question to you is, shouldn't we be better off by just assigning the humans and the bot to completely different tasks? Wouldn't we be expending our energy better if we let the bot do one task, if we let the human do another component of the task, thereby removing the inherently built-in correlations of the input? Yeah, that, that is a different scenario, right? So if there is a big cost on human judgment uh, and you really you have, uh, for example, in these um, citizen science platforms, right? Some of you do research on this. Um, you have a lot of citizen scientists that can uh, make decisions on what's in these images or videos, but there's not enough of them. So you use bots or machine learning algorithms to cover um, so the set of all images that need to be labeled or classified. In that sense, yeah, you want to make smart decisions on you know, which images or videos can be passed to the bot. Uh, you don't want to expend all these human resources, you know, have many or several human judgments for the same image. Uh, and Amazon uh, has a system SageMaker that actually puts this in practice. So you can, um, you can ask Amazon to basically classify a whole bunch of images for you. And they use a combination of human participants and bots. And we don't know what their technology is, but it's, it's some clever sort of algorithm that assigns um, humans and, and bots to different, different types of images. Thank you. Uh, we are almost uh, almost close to the to the to the end, and I wanted to ask both speakers to reflect on on uh, on one aspect that you both mentioned, and that's the role of explainable AI and how we go about um, designing AI or human AI systems where we understand what AI is doing. How how do you see it? What do you think are some important directions there? Can you reflect a little bit on that before we close? Mike, you should respond first, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, for me, um, you know, it, you know, I mean, we, we've been exploring the utility of, of machine learning in our research for, for, for a while now. Um, and, you know, clearly, you know, with computational power now, we, you know, as we've seen both in, in, in the stuff presented today, but also I'm sure in a lot of the other talks in the series, is it's pretty powerful. You can predict a lot of, a lot of things. Um, but for me, the, the ability to kind of open up those, those networks and, and explore the kind of mapping there is a bit of a game changer as a tool. So, you know, when we think about modeling things, as we've seen today, there's many ways we can model things. We can use differential equations, we can use computational rules, we can use Bayesian models. And a lot of the time they're kind of doing the same thing just in a slightly different way. So for anyone to say that one modeling technique is better than another is kind of not really true. They're just different tools for different things. Um, and so for me, it's, it's more like neural networks are now another tool that you have in your arsenal. And with explainable AI, you can now use it as a tool to probe a deeper understanding, whether that is a deeper understanding of what a particular machine learning model is doing. So why is it making those predictions? How is it biased? Is it, you know, is it, is the mapping what we think it are? Um, but the thing I quite, I quite like, which is kind of 
uh, the kind of the point I was trying to make today is that we could also use it as potentially a tool to understand human behavior. So if we can, you know, model that human behavior, then, you know, we can open that box and understand it. And that means we can start to at least test to see in a human machine interaction context, are the, is the way the agent is predicting or doing a task similar in form or type or compatible with the way a human does. Now, the questions that have come up today is maybe they don't always have to be the same. Um, a research I didn't talk about, which I think is, I should have probably given, it would have been closely related to Marx, is we're using the models now to make suggestions to human users when they play these hurting games. And they don't always follow the suggestions of the AI, even if they're expert, but they always do better, you know, even when they don't follow them all the time. So, um, and if the model is more human, then they don't follow them all the time, they do better. So I think I see, you know, Explainable AI as a great, a great tool. Um, and I think is really opening a great number of possibilities. Still a lot of open questions on the human side, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if, if you see a, a great deal more research exploring the utility of them for not just understanding AI models, but actually understanding human behavior when you're using machine learning to model it. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, do you have any? I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answer brief. <clears throat> I'm a bit more skeptical. So I think Mike's uh, uh, use of explainable AI to understand human behavior, I think that's great. In the context where an AI is assisting a human and then is trying to explain what it's doing, all the experiments that I've seen so far, and there's not a whole lot of them, they suggest that there's a real cost of showing explanations to humans. Sometimes these explanations are just not good at all especially when they relate to the inner workings of an algorithm that people just don't really understand. And the explanations don't help to understand the inner working of an algorithm. But there are different types of explanations, but the empirical evidence so far suggests uh, what computer scientists have in mind as a helpful explanation, it's not clear if it's actually helping at all. Uh, the performance without explanations is sometimes better than with explanations. So. This is again why we need to interdisciplinary research. What, what is a helpful explanation? Uh, sometimes when I see computer scientists talk about explainable AI, I'm not so sure if this is uh, good for human uh, consumption. I, yeah, I mean, I, I actually agree with Mark there. I think the one place that we are seeing it beneficial is in the work we're doing with defense. So if we're developing a training technology and we're replacing an expert human with an AI system that has to be human-like, the defense personnel will trust our model more if we can say, look, this is what, this is the reason why the model is making these decisions. And it's exactly the same way that you as the expert would be making those decisions. So that does increase the level of trust in the fact that the decision model is actually following along from what the real human user would do. But Mark, right, that's a very special case where you're not explaining it to the person doing the training, you're explaining it to the, you know, I'm gonna replace you with this model and it's actually gonna make the same decisions that you make and I can show you the information that it's using. So I think that's where you can kind of build better trust into the use of these systems. Um, but that, yeah, that is a kind of a special, a special case. Thank you. You're both amazing. This was great. I learned so much. Um, and uh, let me just advertise the next uh, next session. Next Thursday, we have another exciting couple, Arthur Gresser and Charlie Wu. I invite you all to come. Thank you for your participation and um, see you. See you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.